Today's video is about Christine Claridge in the Seattle Times and how she raped me. Um, rape isn't always a sexual act. There's different kinds of rape. I mean, rape can be when a man asks a woman out on a date and he, you know, pretends that he's this good guy that just wants to get to know a gal, but in reality he wants to, you know, get her really drunk and take his way. You know, there's that kind, or there's the kind where you're just walking down the street and some stranger pops out of the bushes and does what he does, you know, forcefully or whatever. There's that kind. And then there's the kind that isn't sexual at all. The kind where, you know, basically what rape is, is when you take something from somebody that they're not willing to give you. There could be, that, that could be called theft, which is when you take a physical item of somebody's that they didn't want to give you. That's theft. But when you take something non-physical from somebody, you know, when it's sexual, mental, whatever, and you forced it from them, that is rape, period, plain and simple. And Christine Claridge raped me. You know, it was bad enough that I was raped by Gary Ridgway uh, and others <laughs> throughout my life. But when you're raped by a woman, who pretends to be your friend and totally misrepresents herself so that she can get what she wants. That's rape. And she raped me. So, all right, well, let's start with what she did. This here is the article that uh, the Seattle Times did. You can see. Let's see if I can get it in the camera all the way. There we go. So that's the article they did. And, yes, I did make that outfit for myself. That was back when I weighed 259 pounds. Or I think I was about 260, actually. And I've said once before I've never made anything for myself. But I, I did make that, actually, for that day. Um, that was filmed at the old Seattle International Raceway, SIR. Now it's called Pacific Raceway, and actually the day that we did this in 2009, I had gone and told the owners that I was there with the Seattle Times and a camera woman, Helen was there with us the day, Helen was the camera woman who went down to make the report with me to Urquhart, Sergeant Urquhart, who is now Sheriff Urquhart, and he, you know, told me he wasn't going to take my report, and uh, as soon as I left, he was going to wad it up and throw it in the garbage. And now he's sheriff of the King County Police Department. Yeah, that Urquhart. So anyway, um, uh, we went down to do this article, and the people at Seattle Internet or Pacific Raceway found out about it after I told the people in the office, and they sent those people down there to kick us off the property. They didn't even want me on their property to do my story. So, obviously, just a bunch of other rich fucking assholes who don't give a shit about anything decent. All they care about is themselves. Oh, um, so anyway, um, so I contacted, after I contacted Urquhart, and he basically told me to go to hell. He wasn't even going to take my report or listen to me. That's when I contacted the Seattle Times. And Christine Claridge was assigned to do my story. She contacted Urquhart, and he actually spoke to her because, you know, she's a reporter and they work with them. So, you know, but he told her, that's when he told her that they weren't going to listen to me because I had sued the King County Police before. And they didn't like me, so they weren't going to listen to me. And that's what Urquhart told Christine Claridge at first. Then, after, you know, I kept telling her all the details of my story, and she kept relaying them to him, because he wouldn't even listen to me or talk to me on the phone. Reichart, Dave Reichart, none of them would even talk to me. Um, Anderson, there's another cop named Anderson. He, Tim Anderson, I think was his name, but he was just, oh my God, he was really, really mean and cruel. And then I talked to another woman. I'd have to get her name. She's not important. And she's a nothing, but she was also on the task force, and, you know, I thought talking to a woman would make it better. Hell no. That's like I said in the Urquhart video. Women cops are the worst. They're penis wannabes. They want to have a penis so they can keep up with the rest of the dudes, <coughs> and they go out of their way to be as duty as they can 
like a penis and they're actually meaner and crueler to women that you know they don't even want to be foreseen as being weak or or giving in to their woman other women kind or or having a period or emotional or anything like that they're just penis wannabes they're bitches they're fucked in the head and they shouldn't even carry a gun anyway she was the worst she was even worse than urquhart actually but in some ways. So anyway, um, back to Christine Claridge. So she's assigned to do my story. I talked to her over the phone. It took two and a half years, actually, before they actually printed this thing. And I kept asking, you know, when are you going to do my story? When are you going to print my story? I've been talking to the woman for two and a half years. She had enough information. She could have wrote a, a book by then, you know. She promised to put in the information about Bernadette Jones and how she was like the only person I told when we were kids, when she was still Bernadette Kay. And she was going to talk to Bernadette and ask her, you know, if she remembered and what I told her. And she never did, never called Bernadette. Um, she was going to talk to my mom, and then she was going to put in... She did talk to my mom, I think, if I remember. I'd have... Whatever. Anyway, but it wasn't about anything important, and she lied to me about what she was going to write up about my mom, because she was going to put in there how my mom and our relationship was so volatile at the time when I was a kid that I was too afraid to tell her that I'd been raped hitchhiking. I was too scared, because I figured she'd kick my fucking ass for being out hitchhiking. You know? Uh, you know, so now... It's like the guilt. Maybe I, sh I should have just let her kick my ass. I mean, going back now, I would. I would have told. I would have gone to the cops myself. I would have done anything to save those women. Um. Or I. I um. I um. I can't talk about that right now. Um. Mm. -mm. The guilt's too much. Okay. Um. Mm. Okay, so I come over and I met with Christine when we went down to make the report to Urquhart. And uh, that's when he, you know, says, oh, I don't know what you think I'm going to do with this. I'm just going to wad it up and throw it in the garbage when you leave. Okay, so then um, later on, as Christine kept telling him more information, that's when he came out and told her that normally what they do is they um, try to discredit people's story because I guess lots of people come out of the woodwork just claiming to be a victim. I mean, I, I just don't get that. But So they just prove the stories. And mine, he told Christine Claridge that mine was the only one that they couldn't disprove because during the month of December when I, in 79, he had taken a month off from Kenworth and they didn't know where he was. Okay, so moving on. So I met with Christine, and she, that's when Helen took this picture, and they did this. Um, well, she hadn't done the story yet. She was still working on it. So then here comes 2011, February 2011. They had found another body. Oh, I'm not sure if Ridgeway had actually told them about it because the, the deal was with Ridgeway that he had, admitted to so many murders and the deal is if they find any bodies that he didn't admit to they could put the death penalty back on the table so I believe that this is one that he admitted to because otherwise they'd be frying that motherfucker by now um anyway uh so yeah um 2000 February 2011 they uh were gonna arraign him for his 49th murder it's February 17th, I believe, when I came over. It might have been like the 15th or 16th. And I came over on a train from Colville. KHQ in Spokane did a really, really nice story. They they actually came out to my house and interviewed me and did a really good story. I believe it was February 16th, 2011. I don't know if there's archives or if you could go back and look at them. I know the story was on the internet, so there should be a way to find it. But it was KHQ News. It was Anthony Gomez, and it was February 16th, 2011. Just such a nice story. He was so, such a nice guy, very kind. They He told me that normally they don't show the face of rape, rape victims, 
that the news that is just like a policy of all news stations up until then that they never showed any rape victims faces and I am the very first woman ever to come out and show my face on a television and say that I am a, a rape victim and just n up until that day they blurred the faces of women on the TV I mean they did their stories but they would always blur their faces I am the first woman in the history of this planet ever to come out and show my face and just tell my story ever and since I did it I've noticed that now it happens all the time. Women have come out everywhere, all over the country, all the time now, and they just show their faces and they just talk about it openly. You're welcome, ladies. You're welcome. I did that for you. I did that for you. I, I am the very first. Anyway, moving on again. Um, so, KHQ did that really nice story, and then... Um, I got, I came over on the train and somehow I had shown Christine Claridge a, a picture of me when I was back, when I was like 17 or 18 or something. It was a picture of me and Bernadette Kay, who later became Bernadette Jones. And we were at, in Wenatchee at the campground at Lake Wenatchee, sitting at a picnic table. And I showed her that picture and somehow... She asked me to bring the picture with me when I came over. Fine, okay. But while I'm on the train, somehow every news station in Seattle found out that I was coming over for this arraignment. Every single one of them. My freaking cell phone starts going off while I'm on the train. I mean, this is an emotional thing. I'm scared. I'm, I'm worried about coming over. I'm worried about how I'm going to be treated, what's going to happen. And so here my phone just starts going off. I mean, I was about ready to get off the train and turn around and go back. But they're all asking me if they if it would be okay if they met me at the train station, if they could talk to me and this, that, and the other. Well, I'm kind of a... It's really hard for me to tell people no. It really is. And, and so I just agreed. I'm always trying to make people happy. I'm always trying to do the right thing. So I let them... And when the train pulled into Seattle, I swear, it was like a freaking circus. There was... It scared me so bad. I almost didn't even want to get off the train. There was nothing but camera people there um, filming me get off the train. I guess I wasn't sexy or pretty enough when I got off the train because none of those uh, ended up on the TV. Not one single picture of me getting off the train. Even though there were like 10 or more cameras there all filming me. I, I guess I should have done a sexy walk or something. I don't know what the fuck they were looking for. So then I go in the train station, and Tanya Mosley, I believe, was the very first one from, I think she's with King 5 or Como, I'm not sure which, because anyway, there were, there were um... so I talked to Tanya Mosley first, and there was another colored gal from one of the other stations standing behind her, and I'll never forget, because Tanya was super sweet, and she's sitting there t talking to me and asking questions, and this other woman is standing behind her. I mean, just mm, dirty looking her. I mean, I like could tell that it was obvious she was angry that the other woman got to me first. And then there was the little mousy chick from from Q13. Oh my God, I almost felt sorry for her because she kept trying to come up and talk to me, but she's just this little tiny thing. Couldn't have been but four foot ten maybe or something. Shorter than me. I'm five foot two and she's shorter than me. Just this little tiny skinny mousy looking thing. And she kept trying to get up talk to me and everybody just kept running over the top of her. She never even got close. Which was funny because about a year ago I actually saw her on the 11 o'clock news. She now works in the newsroom in front of the cameras. So she finally got out of having to chase the story down and being run over by other reporters and actually made it to the newsroom. Congratulations, honey. Uh, if I remembered your name, I would say it, but I don't because you never actually got close to me. They were running over you. Okay, so the news station. Um, Tanya, she somehow knew about this photo, and she asked me if she could see it. So I'm like, okay, this is how I knew Christine leaked it. Somehow, Christine Claridge is the one who leaked it all. And so I pull the picture out, and I show it. Tanya takes it, and she puts... In the train station, there's these big old wooden 
benches, like really super old fashioned wooden benches with the high backs and stuff. So she takes a picture and sets it along the back along with with uh, the book from Anne Rule, uh, Green River Running Red, because that's how I figured out who Ridgeway was in the first place. I was standing in a grocery store, picked up Anne Rule's book, flipping through the pictures, saw the picture of him from 1982, and I just about fainted in the grocery line. I recognized him immediately. So anyway, Tiny Mosley puts the book against the backdrop and then puts the picture there and takes a picture of it and all this. I didn't really think anything of it at the time. So I leave the train station. Uh, Christine finally showed up at the train station. In fact, that's another reason, looking back, I know she set all this shit up. Because she wasn't even at the train station when the train pulled in. She shows up like a half an hour later, an hour later, whatever. Giving all the other news people plenty of time to get their chunk of me. So she takes me out to lunch because, like I said, the Seattle Times conned me into coming over in the first place. Christine told me they were going to pay for my motel. They were going to pay for all my food. She was going to be with me every step of the way to make sure that I wasn't scared, that I wasn't by myself, that I had support. She was going to be my friend. She was going to be with me the whole time. You know, but I, I apparently I had to pay for everything in the in the beginning, and then she turned in. She was going to turn in voucher or I, I forgot how she explained it but I'd get reimbursed later so anyway she picks me up she took me lunch she did pay for my burger and then she takes me to this motel and I pay I check in anyway then the next day comes when we're supposed to go to the arraignment and the arraignment was like at nine in the morning so Six, seven o'clock in the morning, I'm up, I'm getting ready, I'm nervous, I'm getting scared, you know, I'm just like, whoa, no Christine, no Christine, no call. I start calling the Seattle Times, I'm like, what's going on, when are you going to be here? Oh, my editor is telling me that I have to do something else, that I've been reassigned to something else. I'm like, what? Are you fucking kidding me? I have no transportation, I have barely enough money for one more meal, and... You know, I had bought a round trip ticket for the train, so fortunately I wasn't going to be stuck in Seattle, but I had no way to even get to the arraignment or anything, and I, st I was freaking. So um, finally Christine gets permission from her editor, I guess, to give me a ride down to the RJC in Kent. So, I mean, she's already starting to fuck me over, and... So she picks me up, she's not even, she's just dressed in jeans and not even, like, work clothes, like she's going to go home and go back to bed or something. And she takes me down to the RJC, all the camera trucks are there, her Seattle Times, everybody's there, and this Jennifer, in fact, Seattle Times, it should have been Christine who was there with me, but instead they took Christine off the story, and this Jennifer, I forgot her last name, but she was this blonde, tall blonde, she was a fucking bitch, stuck up fucking bitch, she didn't even talk to me, she looked down her nose at me, and pretty much gave me nasty, dirty looks the whole time, like, almost like, I just can't believe that anybody would do a story about her, you know, that was just kind of like the looks she was giving me, and... So I go and I get in line to get into the courtroom. I'm thinking I'm not really going to get in because there's so many people there. There's a murder victim's family. And I, I really wanted to go talk to them, but I was too scared. It was their moment, not mine. What the, what the fuck? I mean, why was everybody making it about me? It was bullshit. Anyway, um, so I'm standing in line. I'm talking to other people. I met this one really nice. Um, it really sucks when you say things about people's race because everybody will go, oh, my God, she's a racist because she mentioned why did she have to even say the woman was Mexican or black or this or the other. It just, just because I want to portray the story completely accurately and it doesn't mean, you know, what my opinion of this race of people is. I'm just describing just like you would, a, oh, a heavy set woman. Well, does that mean you hate fat people because you described her as a heavy set woman? No. It's just giving a more accurate description. So anyway, I was speaking with a Mexican lady. She was a bit older than me. Such a sweetheart. Oh, my God. She was so sweet. And we started talking about things, and she told me that how she, the reason she was there was because she had driven by, she was driving to work one day. She kind of insinuated that she gets 
she didn't come out with the word psychic, but she gets visions, she gets feelings, and she was driving by the place where they actually found Opal, and um, she got a feeling, and she just knew it, and she went home, I believe she said she went home and told people, but she she didn't tell the police or whatever, but they ended up finding the body there later. And it was it was the right place. And anyway, that's why she was there, just because she she just wanted to be part of it because she had, had these feelings and she'd known. So I'm talking to her, and I go, and while I'm standing there, the head of the King County Police Department security comes up to me, and she says, you know, we heard that you're going to stand up in the middle of this arraignment, and you're going to hold your picture up, and you're going to ask if if he remembers you. I'm like, what? I, I didn't know anything about any of this nonsense. And this is totally stuff Christine made up. And Christine is, was playing off. This was all her game. And so I'm like, no, I'm not going to do any such thing. I actually didn't even think I was going to get into the courtroom. I figured it would be over full and, and I'd just have to wait in the hall or something, you know. But she's like, oh, well, I'm here to tell you if you do that, um, I, we will remove you from the courtroom and you could be prosecuted. I'm like, whoa, I'm not going to do anything. So I finally get up to the front of the line. And they had literally, there was no other places left in court, but somehow they had literally saved a place for me right behind the table where Ridgeway was going to be sitting, right behind him. I get into the courtroom. Okay, so... The, when you get in there, there's the table where Ridgeway is going to be, and then right behind it, I'm sitting there, and then over on this side of the courtroom is the murder victim's family, and then up front here is the juror's box. Okay, in the juror's box, all of the newspaper people were there. Every news station, every camera person, every freaking chair was had a camera person in it. Every one of the cameras are pointing right at me. Right at me. They're not even filming the murder victim's family. They're not even talking to them. Every freaking camera pointing at me. I'm like, okay, this is not right. This is bullshit. I'm really getting a bad feeling about all this by now. And so then the cops come in. There's 18 cops. I counted them. 18 King County cops in the courtroom. Eight of them are between me and Ridgeway. There's more cops between me and Ridgeway than the murder victim's family. And the murder victim's family shoved over here in the back side of the court over furthest away. Nobody's really paying attention to them. Maybe one or two cops standing in front of them. They were, I don't know what descent they were, but I think they might have been. I don't know, but one. there were a couple, I don't know if they were brothers, cousins, whatever, but there were a couple of young, pretty decent-sized dudes with the family of the murder victim, and they could have easily jumped across that and went for Ridgeway. And being as the fact that they only put one or two cops over on that side of the courtroom, they wouldn't have been able to stop these guys. They would have fucking had Ridgeway before anybody could have done shit. But there's eight of them in between me and Ridgeway. Like, like they're totally expecting me to do something. All the cameras are pointing at me. At the time, I had really super long hair. I mean, it was really long down to my ass. So I just sit there and I pull all my hair over my face. So <laughs> later when you're actually looking at the newspaper, when I was looking, flipping through the news channels later that night, all you see is this person with super long hair sitting behind, look like fucking Cousin It from Adam's family sitting behind Ridgeway. Except for this one time. I mean, I have to thank... King 5 News, they did the absolute best as far as for me, for because I'm sitting later that night, I'm sitting in my motel room flipping through the news channels looking at all these news stories from that day, and here I flip on to channel 5, okay, I have to back up a little, so while I'm in the courtroom, the only time I even looked up or did anything, I kind of elbowed the woman next to me, and I'm like, do you think I'll get in trouble for doing this? And I'm sitting behind Ridgeway just mm, like this, like I'm freaking strangling the bastard. So later that night, I'm sitting in my motel room and I'm flipping through all the channels. And I flipped through Channel 5. And right when I flipped it to Channel 5, here I am sitting behind the Green River Killer. Mm, 
It was fucking awesome. It was really awesome. You have no idea how how good it felt. I mean, of course, it would have felt much better to actually have my hands on his throat and choke the fucking life right out of him. Watch the last breath leave his body. Watch his eyes dilate as he fucking dies. That would have been great. But this was as close to it as I could have possibly gotten. And it was, it was good. It was good. <laughs> so anyway. All right. So back to when I was at the courtroom. So um, that happened. So I get up and I go to leave after the court thing is done. Christine had left. She freaking left. Um, I had to find my own way back to the motel room in Seattle Literally, when she dropped me off, she's like, oh, there's camera people. There's all kinds of people going back to Seattle. I'm sure you can find a ride from somebody. Fortunately, while I was in the courtroom, another person got, you know, heard my story. This young gal, she was maybe a few years younger than me, and she found me after, outside the courtroom after it was all over and introduced herself and said that she believed that she was a victim of Ridgeway too. And that she had heard my story, that she had heard how I had been discredited because uh, I said that uh, he was driving a big green four-door car. And she said that she wanted to tell me her story too because she had actually been picked up by a man in Hobart the same month in a big green four-door car, and she believed it to be Ridgeway as well. And the police wouldn't listen to her either. So there's more than just me out there. And um, like I said in the Urquhart story, you'd think the profilers or somebody might be interested in all this information so they could have actually been more accurate in the stories. You know, I, I watch, you know, all these stories like Dateline or 2020 when they do all these stories about murders and people and Ridgeway or whatever. Half the time, Ridgeway isn't even in them. Like, I just got this book. Here, just hang on a minute. Um, I bought this a few months ago. Actually, it might have been, um, let me put my sexy glasses back on. It was, uh, God, there's got to be a date on it. My sexy glasses aren't working enough to tell me what the date on this damn thing is. Anyway, it was the, the Time magazines, the most notorious serial killers. Ridgeway's not even in here. He's not even in here. This is bullshit. Um, yeah, um, and then there was another one that came out from People. People Magazine did another one at the exact same time that Time Magazine did this. He's not in that one either. It's like, you're fucking kidding me. The man murdered 48 or more, 49 women that he has admitted to, and they suspect him of over, you know, 100 or more, and the motherfucker didn't even make it into Time Magazine. Are you killing me? Are you... Are, <laughs> yeah, seriously. Are you killing me? Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. Um, then I guess Ridgeway actually did do one interview. And I, my mom taped it. I have it on a CD. I haven't actually watched it yet. I'm, I don't think I, I can yet. I'm not, I'm not ready to yet. <clears throat> but, all right, back to Christine. How she fucking... Oh, my God. Bitch, dumped me there. Didn't even take me back to my motel room. Um, then later that night when I'm sitting in my motel room and I, I had my laptop with me and I'm reading the, all the comments and stuff because they had the news feed where people comment and everything. Oh, another thing that has changed since me, I got my daughter-in-law, my son and my daughter-in-law and I were not getting along at the time and my mom. Because I said, we've had such a volatile relationship for so many years. And at that particular time, my mom and I weren't speaking. Uh, my son and I, my oldest son and I were on the outs. And his wife, whom I hate, I freaking hate my daughter-in-law, Tina Renee Summers. I hate your fucking guts. Bitch works for Home Depot in Atlanta, Georgia. Hate her goddamn guts. Anyway, um, that backstabbing fucking little cunt who didn't even know anything about me, didn't, she, I, at the time, had only even been part of our family for like a year, a year and a half, and the bitch gets on the internet and just starts slamming me and saying shit about me being a liar and this, that, and the other, 
And there were a couple other people. I don't know who they were because, of course, they used different names. But they were probably from my past. Either some bitch whose job I took or her boyfriend left her because she liked me or whatever. But some fucking assholes from my past got on there and just started slamming me. So the Seattle Times pulled the feed. Inst nobody... My son, my youngest son, stood up for me, and he got on there and was battling everybody that said anything bad, and I just didn't even make any comments. I just couldn't. It was too hard, too emotional. I didn't want to spend the time fighting with a bunch of idiots and morons and evil people, but my youngest son, he tried. Thank you for trying, but... Um, yeah, between his older brother and his sister-in-law and his grandmother and other people from my past, you know, he, 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 the Seattle Times just pulled the whole thread. And ever since then, I've noticed that newspapers don't let people comment anymore. You can, yeah, it's crazy. There's no comment feeds anymore. So, or you have to, you have to register your name or something because that way they know if bad people or people say bad shit. I guess it was their way to try and make people be nicer or something. I don't know. But I, I got freaking slammed really hard. You know, not only am I the first woman who shows my face and, and talks about my, what happened to me, but... I get slammed so bad that they change the way comment feeds work in newspapers after that. Um, so anyway, so I, f I get on the train, I leave, I go back home. And Christine, she wouldn't even hardly talk to me after that. It's like, and of course they didn't pay. They didn't reimburse me for anything, not a fucking thing. So, oh, and then, like, for six months or a year, she doesn't even hardly talk to me at all, but then all of a sudden she starts sending me comments on my Facebook. She's my Facebook friend. So then she starts seeing pictures of my husky. I had a white husky, the one that I gave to my son. Well, I gave him to my husband, and my husband abandoned her, so my son took her. But back when she was still my dog... Christine found out about it, and she wanted to breed her male to him, to her because she wanted a puppy, and I had agreed to it. So, so I kept coming over to my mom's, and I was supposed to bring Mika over, and we were supposed to get together and and let the dogs do their thing or whatever, but I think, I don't even know why. I don't know why she contacted me on Facebook. I still haven't really figured that one out, and I don't know why she played this stupid little game with the dogs because... When I actually came over, because we actually made an appointment to do this thing. We were going to get together, have drinks. I was going to spend the night at her house. I mean, I even have pictures of her house on my Facebook and everything. All these pictures that she sent me of her boyfriend and, and her dogs and all this stuff. And we had set up the time to meet. And I get over here and I'm like, okay, Christine, I'm here. When? You, what time do you want me to come over? No comment. No comment. I kept sending back, Christine, hey, you wanted me to come over? I was going to spend the night tonight. When do you, what time? What? No comment, no comment. So then a day goes by. I'm like, hey, you stood me up. What happened? Is something wrong? No comment, no comment. I mean, she would like, she never, ever commented. Wouldn't speak to me ever again. Like, bitch, why did you even contact me on Facebook? Why did you go to all out of that way to pretend like you were going to still be my friend and then you get me to come on over here, even had a time, a d everything. We were, I was supposed to spend the night at your house. And you fucking, wow, what? You psycho crazy weirdo after what you did to me? Oh, my God. I mean, if it weren't for the fact that attorneys are such ambulance-chasing worthless losers and you can't actually find a decent attorney to do shit, I should have had a goddamn lawsuit against the Seattle Times for what they fucking did to me. Are you kidding me? You assholes. But I will admit, bitch did a really good story. So I'm going to put on my sexy little $5 reading glasses, and I'm going to read you the story that she did. She did do. That's the only justice she did. She did a good story. Woman Believes Green River Killer Raped Her 31 Years Ago by Christine Claridge. Jennifer Paxton was 16 years old in December 1979 when she walked out on 
to the Kit Kat. It's really dark, so my, I have very good reading skills, but it's really dark. Okay, so Jennifer Paxton was 16 years old in December 1979 when she walked out to the Kent Kingley Road and stuck out her thumb. The man who picked her up was slim and in his 20s with sandy blonde hair, a mild manner, a mild manner. Oh my God, I can't read it so dark. With sandy blonde hair, a mild manner, and beady little eyes. Oh, yes, they were. That's the one thing I remember is beady little eyes, she recalls. He drove her into the woods uh, near a... God, this is bullshit. I need lighting. Um, okay. He drove her into the woods near a racetrack in Kent where he raped her and then threw her from his car, she says. Paxton, now 47, says she never reported the assault because she was afraid police wouldn't believe her and feared her mother would blame her for hitchhiking in skimpy clothes. <laughs> Life for Paxton, though often troubled and marked by repeated... And I have not even read this since it came out. This is the first time I've read it since 2011 or 9, whatever. 2011 when this came out. Okay, run-ins with the law went on. It wasn't until 2003 when she picked up a book on the Green River Killer that she believes she again came face-to-face -face with the man who raped her. His name, Gary L. Ridgway. I looked down at his picture and I said, oh my God, that's him. That's the man who raped me. In the years since, police repeatedly have told Paxton that Ridgway was likely not her attacker on that rainy night. Convicted of 48 murders and suspected of many more, he wasn't known, mm, he wasn't known to spare the lives of his victims, investigators said. Sergeant John Urquhart, spokesman for the King County Sheriff's Office, said Paxton's rape did not fit Ridgway's known modus operandi. Even if police believed that Ridgway's crimes against women began with rape, Urquhart said there would be no point in investigating the attack. In Washington, the statute of limitations on Raping rape charges or on filing charges for rape runs out ten years after the crime. Still, Urquhart said others concede that investigators likely will never know the depth, the full depth of Ridgeway's depravity. We're, ne we're never going to know. Excuse me. Excuse me. Ah. Uh, okay. Let me try it again. We're never going to know the truth about all he's done, Urquhart said. Uh, I don't know if I can do this. Hang on. Okay. The full depth of retrace. We're never going to know the truth about all he's done, Urquhart said. Ridgeway doesn't even remember the faces of the women he killed. Paxton, nevertheless... Plans on being in Seattle courtroom on Friday to confront Ridgeway at his arraignment in King County Superior Court for the slaying of. See, if they hadn't actually put this paper out yet when I came here, or I might have gotten a heads up what they were fucking planning. It was Becky Marrero. I'm sorry, Becky. I should have read this before, but, and I should never have forgotten which one whose family was there that day. I'm so sorry. Every one of you are deserved better, even from me. I'm so sorry. This is Becky Murrow. Um, Paxton. Uh, nevertheless, 
Plans on being in the Superior Court room on Friday to confront Ridgeway at his arraignment in King County Superior Court for the sling of Rebecca Becky Marrero, who police believe is the killer's 49th victim. The remains of the 20-year-old woman who was last seen December 3rd, 1982, recently were unearthed near Auburn, allowing prosecutor's office to charge Ridgeway with a, the slaying that long had been linked to him in a plea deal with that likely spared his life. Ridgeway pleaded guilty in 2003 to 48 counts of aggravated first degree and was sentenced to 48 consecutive life sentences. If he pleads guilty to Marrera's slaying, the deal still will hold and Ridgeway will be returned to prison. Paxton plans to stand in the courtroom and hold up a photo of herself at 16. She hopes to look Ridgeway in the eyes and ask him, do you remember me? I never ever said that. It was not me. I would have never done that. I would have never had the guts to do that. And uh, I never said that. Like I said, they, she actually didn't. This story wasn't actually printed and, and released until that very day. This was that day of the arraignment. I hadn't even read it yet. Rapist let her go. It was after dark when Paxton decided to hitchhike from her boyfriend's in Kent, in boyfriend's Kent house to her home in Maple Valley. There were two men in the green sedan that stopped for her. The driver dropped her his passenger off at an apartment complex nearby. It was called the, um, oh gosh, I, I'll finish the story and then I'll remember. Because she should have printed that. And then asked Paxton if she wanted to go to a kegger. As they drove up and down the hilly woods surrounding the former Seattle International Raceway off of Highway 18 near Kent, Paxton looked for the campfire she was expecting. But he just kept driving and driving around and I got nervous, she recalled. The minute the car stopped, I was out the door. But he flew out and was on me. He caught me by my ponytail and dragged me to the car she said i asked him if he was going to kill, kill me and he said not if you be good when he was dead he told her to get her clothes the man took paxton paxton's purse cigarettes and lighter threw her out of the car and then left she said Paxton stood there a moment in the darkness, then crawled up a ravine. A nice family, she describes him as churchy, stopped for her on Highway 18. They were concerned and wanted to help, but all she wanted was a ride. She refused to, to, her, to let them know where she lived. I didn't want them to contact my mother because then... It wouldn't be bad for me, I thought, she said. It would be bad for me, I thought, she said. She went inside and ran a super hot, scalding bath, got in and cried. She remained silent about the attack because she was afraid she would be called a slut and whore and yelled at for getting... A ride from a stranger, Paxton said. Paxton says she struggled after the attack. She became a frequent runaway and learned quickly that sex was one of the sure ways to get a place to sleep and a warm meal. She was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and is on disability because of it. She began fighting with every police officer and authority figure that crossed her path. She's been arrested numerous times, mostly for fighting and harassing people, and has f filed lawsuits against the County Sheriff's Office and other law enforcement agencies over false arrests and other claims. They just think I'm crazy and a pain in the ass, she said of police. Her husband, Bill Paxton, said he thinks a lot of her troubles can be traced to her failure to get treatment or counseling after the assault. 
anger is her defense mechanism and it causes her to go up in conflict, he said. She has a lot of hatred and mistrust for men pent up deep below. It bubbles up and makes her feel like striking out at the government and police officials. Can't be quiet forever. Despite years of therapy, Paxton didn't see, see my husband's a moron. I, I don't know why he said that because I had years of therapy. But he's an asshole. Anyway, this, yeah, and, and if he was so understanding, why didn't he get some, you know, clues on how to respond to when I get upset or angry if he loved me so much, as he says. Despite years of therapy, Paxton didn't really begin to control her anger with the rape. Or didn't really begin to connect her anger with the rape. She was waiting in line at a grocery store in Colville, Stevens County, where she lives with her husband and younger son. When she saw the book on the Green River Killer, she flipped it open and saw Ridgeway's face. It looks exactly like him, and it happened in his hunting grounds. Kent Kingley is exactly where he would have been driving around, Paxton said. She started reading about him and his victims, and she became angry. All of them were people like her, she said, women and girls whose lives had been marginalized and whose voices were dulled. Most were young runaways, prostitutes, and drug addicts. The cops wouldn't have cared if one of them had been raped. They only cared when they became victims of a serial killer, she said. Paxton said she was willing to talk about what happened to her, not because... She wanted to be known as the victim of an infamous killer, but because it makes her feel better. If somebody could prove Ridgway was not her attacker, she would be happy, she said. It would be easier for me to put it away if I found out that I was one isolated incident, she said. Then I wouldn't have to live with the guilt that if I'd reported it, those other women might have lived. I wanted too long. To rep I waited too long to report my rape, but I can't be quiet forever, she added. It uh, might not make a bit of difference legally, but maybe someone will get some courage from hearing me stand up for myself. Christine Claridge, area code 206-464-8983. Or... Claridge, she spells it C L at uh, SeattleTimes dot com. Whatever. Okay. All right. So I'm sorry that this one went on a long, long time. It was a really hard, hard one to do. Um. There's so much more involved with the story. Um, one of these times I'll tell about the night that it actually happened. Sam, the boyfriend who I was going to see, who was well over 21 and had basically should have been prosecuted as well because he was a child molester. But um, he was cute. And... I'll tell the story about him, Sam. Because <laughs> that's another thing Christine said that she was going to report. Um, when I, The very first time that I met with Christine and Helen, we all three got in the car and we went to find the house that I went to and I wanted to show her where I was when I stuck my thumb out. Springdale Apartments. That's the apartments. I took her to... Sam's house off Kent Kangley showed her, I, I took her right to the house. I had explained to her where it was before that you go to this one intersection. I forgot the intersection and you turn left and then you turn right. The very first one in the neighborhood, go up two blocks, turn left. And it's like the second house on the right. Ended up being the exact freaking house. I mean, I, we went up and knocked on the door. Nobody would answer. We left a note 
you know, asking the homeowner if he remembered Sam, if Sam still lived there, or if he had bought the home from someone named Sam, how long he'd lived there, or whatever. We kind of just left a note explaining why we were there, but the homeowners never returned the call. They apparently, if Sam was there, he was too embarrassed or ashamed to admit it. Or if it was other people, they just didn't want to be involved. I don't know, but they never returned the call. So we left the neighborhood, and I took him down and showed him exactly where I was when I stuck my thumb out. Where I was picked up. And then we went down, and we tried to find the Springdale Apartments. Springdale Apartments had been torn down years and years ago. Um, so that's the thing. Like, when Ridgeway picked me up, there was another man in the car. And we took him to the Springdale Apartments. I, you know, if they were still there, I could show exactly where we dropped him off. So there's some man out there who remembers. There is some man out there in the world who knows exactly who that guy was driving that car. And if the King County Police had even given one fucking shit about me, if they had just even investigated at all. I know that the statute of limitations is gone. I know all that. I know Ridgeway's been prosecuted. I know there's nothing more they could do to him and all this shit. But what about me? Don't I deserve something? Don't I deserve something? I mean, if they could just if they had put in even the slightest bit of effort, maybe they could have found out who that guy was at the Springdale Apartments. I don't know, or something. You know, maybe he'll see my story and he'll come out and he'll remember. Hey, that 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 December night in '79, I was with my work coworker or something, and I remember him stopping and picking up this. Blonde girl on Ken Kingley. Maybe he'll remember it. And then he could come out and he could say for sure if it was Ridgeway or if it was someone else. You know? If it wasn't Ridgeway, then I could know that it wasn't my fault. That if I had if I had told it wouldn't made any difference. Because if it wasn't Ridgeway then maybe the person who actually did it, if it wasn't Ridgeway, which I know it was Ridgeway, I mean, but of course I'm human, I could have made a mistake. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, there's absolutely no human way possible. I could have made a mistake. Of course. I mean, there's, I'm 99.999% sure, but my God, you know, there is this tiny little chance. So if they found this person that could say, oh, hey, it was Ridgeway. And then I would know, or no, it wasn't Ridgeway, so that I could forgive myself a little bit for not telling. Because the worst part of the whole thing, what happened to me happened to me. I'm still here, whatever. But there's a lot of girls that aren't. And just to... to, to, to uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a good thing I don't know for sure because I don't know if I could bear living with it if I knew for sure. I don't know if I could even bear that. But, um, okay. Um, that's all I could do. That's all I can say now. Um, yeah, so as far as I'm concerned, I was raped a second time by the Seattle Times and Christine Claridge. They were, wow. I mean,. Is that how you treat, is this how victims are treated? I mean, we victimize them again, over and over and over again. Is that what we do in this society? Yes, it is.